Hello everyone and welcome to the third and final session of Meet Delix Mushrooms, a three-part live stream series powered by Midasin. My name is Kirby Duncan and I'm the marketing director here at Delacorp and I want to thank everyone who has tuned in as we take a deep dive into the fantastic world of fungi. Today we're joined by a panel of industry experts with a background in medicinal mushrooms which are all the rage right now. For the panel, we'll explore what defines a medicinal mushroom, what are their real benefits, how are they best consumed, and even how medicinal mushrooms have been utilized in Eastern cultures for thousands of years. And to back it all up, we'll look at the current research being done and what new implications are on the horizon for these amazing organisms. Now, before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to our friends and valued partners at Midasin Innovations Group, who have partnered with Meat Delic to bring you today's panel. Midasin Innovations Group is an emerging biotech and life sciences company dedicated to developing and commercializing innovative solutions for treating mental health problems and enhancing vitality. The heart of Midasin's core philosophy is that psychedelic assisted thera psychotherapy will continue to gain acceptance in the medical community with many of the world's best accredited research organizations demonstrating its remarkable clinical effectiveness. Midasin recognizes the responsibility associated with the psychedelic assisted therapy and will continue to position itself as a long-term leader across the spectrum of clinical trials, research, technology, and global supply. For more information, visit Midasin.net. Speaking of more information, here at Delic Corp, we have got a lot going on, including the recent announcement of the year's biggest in-person psychedelic edutainment event, Meet Delic, taking place this November 6th and 7th in Las Vegas. Meet Delic is the world's premier psychedelic and wellness edutainment event catering to holistic healers, revolutionary businesses, thought leaders, and curious newcomers. Held in Area 15, and if you have not checked out Area 15, be sure to head to their Instagram or their website. It is such a cool, immersive, and experiential entertainment complex right in the heart of Las Vegas. Meet Delic will be held over two days featuring industry entrepreneurs, psychonauts, leading voices in research, science, and wellness, all gathered to explore the intersection of psychedelic health and wellness. So if you're exploring how to start or grow your business, looking to connect with like-minded visionaries, or just a lover of psychedelic art, entertainment, and fun social activities that embrace psychedelic culture, this is the event for you. Head to meetdelic.com to buy your tickets for the amazing opportunity to witness the acceleration of this worldwide psychedelic movement. Just last week, we announced the lineup, which has thought leaders like Duncan Trussell, Aubrey Marcus, Allison Charles, and Jason Silva from brands like Compass Pathways and Field Trip and leading medical experts like Dr. Carl Hart and Dave Rabin and so, so much more. So once again, head to meetdelic.com for the full lineup and get your tickets before they sell out. To stay up to date on the latest event announcements, be sure to head over to our Instagram at meetdelic to follow for the latest updates as we'll be announcing more speakers music entertainment, and more. You are not going to want to miss it. As I mentioned, this is the final of a three-part series, so if you're joining us for the first time, be sure to visit meetdelic.com backslash virtual to watch the playbacks from previous events and be on the lookout for this playback to drop next week. And now let's get to our panel of experts. First up, we've got William Padilla Brown. Founder of Microsymbiotics, William Padilla Brown is a multidisciplinary citizen scientist practicing the social science, mycology, phycology, molecular biology, and additive manufacturing. William is constantly in the mix of contemporary ritual and a nuanced modern urban shamanism, spending his time vlogging for social media, writing, contributing for Fungi Mag, researching, rapping, singing, and loving his beautiful lady Lydia and their son Leo. William wrote the first books in English on cordyceps cultivation. He regularly teaches around the United States for universities, including Cornell's Smart Farms program, private clubs and events, as well as offers private consultations. William and his work have been featured on Fantastic Fungi, Vice, Buzzfeed, The Verge, Outside Magazine, Civil Eats, Public Goods, and the book One Earth. Next up, we have Aaron Cochran, co-founder and director of product at Guella. 
Aaron is a holistic wellness and mycology specialist with experience ranging from mushroom cultivation, permaculture, community-based healing, and nutrition as medicine. After the passing of her mother at an early age from cancer, she has dedicated her life to understanding and pursuing holistic wellness. She studied kinesiology where she focused on the holistic application of lifestyle modifications to improve body function, underlying health concerns, and chronic conditions. Her diverse passions then led her to explore and study the field of sustainability management, emphasizing not only human holistic wellness, but also environmental. She has spent time abroad across Latin America, exploring and studying intentional communities, permaculture, and ancient teachings on spiritual wholeness. She is now applying her experience as co-founder and director of product with Guella Mushrooms, as well as co-founder and facilitator of the Healing While Healing Women's Support Network. Next up, we have Dr. Mason Brissett, neuropathic doctor and medical advisor. Mason has a general family neuropathic practice in Serena, Ontario, the Health Creation Lab. He uses medicinal mushrooms, herbal medicine, hydropathy, acupuncture, nutrition, and mind-body medicine in his clinic to support his patients. He continues to provide up-to-date research and education for real mushroom practitioners, a group of healthcare professionals using real mushroom products in their practices. He actively works with medical doctors and oncologists setting up research studies that utilize medicinal mushroom extracts. Next, Rob Roscow, MA the Chief Science Officer and Co-Founder of Midison Innovations Group. As a highly educated geneticist, Rob has spent both his academic and professional careers looking for valuable and unique medicinal molecules found in nature. The last two companies that Robert applied his innovations to were Canopy Growth and Ebu, where he ran their genetics division. Mr. Roscoe has already leveraged an expertise in genomics, evolution, and molecular biology to maximize the industrial production of cannabinoids and their use in a pharmacological context. This work has resulted in multiple patent filings and accolades and publications ranging from Nature to Rolling Stone. Now, Mr. Roscoe has set his focus on the vast healing potential of fungi. And last, but certainly not least, today's moderator, Dr. Britt Bunyard, PhD. Britt is the founder, publisher, and editor-in-chief of the mycology journal Fungi. Britt has worked academically as a mycologist his entire career, teaching a number of university courses and writing scientifically for many research journals and popular science magazines. He has served as an editor for mycological and entomological research journals and mushroom guidebooks. A popular evangelizer on all things fungal, Britt has been featured on NPR's All Things Considered, PBS's Nova and Wisconsin foodie television programs. In addition, he's been interviewed or quoted in Discover Magazine, The Atlantic, Vox, Vogue, Forbes, Eating Well, Hobby Farm, Women's World, and other magazines and newspapers. He has authored several books, including Beginner's Guide to Mushrooms, Mushrooms and Macrofungi of Ohio and Midwestern States, and the forthcoming series, The Secret Life of Fungi, due spring 2022. He currently serves as the executive director for the Telluride Mushroom Festival. All right, what a group. Uh, once again, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. And for the audience, if you have questions, be sure to type them into the chat. Our team will collect them and share them with Britt to read aloud for our experts to answer. And now I will kick it off to today's moderator, Britt Bunyard. All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I guess everyone can hear me okay. So uh, I'm really excited for today's group and panel discussion because as was mentioned, I'm the publisher and editor in chief of Fungi Magazine. And while medicinal mushrooms are probably the most popular topic right now in mycology, uh, it's not really my strong suitor area of research. So I'll be uh, excited to learn just as much as everybody else dialing in. So, um, oh, there I am. I <laughs> uh, thought I clicked on that, sorry about that. So um, to kick things off, I mean, everyone tuning is probably pretty familiar with uh, medicinal mushrooms, their use going back several millennia, probably back to uh, China uh, thousands of years ago. But uh, most curiously from uh, my standpoint, uh, 
I'm wondering in the West where things really got started and maybe we'll uh, have William kick this off and take this first question. So what do you think, William? All right, so um, in the West, it wasn't until around the 1700s that the French picked up on uh, the cultivation of agaricus by sporus through um, biomimicry, um, just through you know witnessing them growing in the field on the manure of various farm animals, uh, ruminant animals, um, because a lot of the agaricus um, in uh, rural agricultural settings in, in old Europe uh, would follow a cycle of being consumed by a ruminating animal in the grass, their spores, um, then passing through the gut and then, you know, germinating in, th in through their manure. Um, <clears throat> so they were initially cultivated in caves, uh, through compost, and also in uh, horse barns. Um, and then uh, cultivation spread through Europe and Italy and um, it wasn't until some Italian florists from Eastern Pennsylvania um, started going over to uh, Italy um, that they noticed that some of their relatives were cultivating the agaricus mushrooms, which they brought back to uh, Eastern Pennsylvania and started cultivating um, under their floral beds in the greenhouses, uh, which was the beginning and rise of uh, the Eastern Pennsylvania uh, mega uh, mushroom farms that produce millions of pounds a month uh, here. Um, so as far as Western uh, culture goes, you know, it's only been a couple hundred years that we've really been digging into um, cultivation uh, for food and uh, only more recently uh, for medicine, you know, um, so really, really new. I'm going to have to remember to hit my mute button. So uh, probably even more recently than that, that things finally made its way from Europe over here to North America, wouldn't you say? Because it seems like most of the papers that I was seeing a few decades ago were still coming out of the East and not really from North America, from researchers such as yourself, William, looking at stuff like this. Yeah, I mean, even, to, even today, um, with the publishing of my book and a lot of the research that I continue to do, <clears throat> a lot of the pharmacological studies um, around the medicinal usage of uh, of mushrooms is still coming from the east um, just due to um, regulations around research and things like that uh, is, is my own assumption. I'm not, I'm not in an academic background, nor have I been. I'm starting to uh, enter into those environments. Um, but for whatever reason, um, the research hasn't been done here as far as human clinical studies. Um, what we have done uh, is more animal studies. So like with mice and you know pigs and, and things like that. Um, but you know there is things happening now. Um, it's this these past two years have been really interesting um, for um, research in North America uh, as far as medicinal mushrooms go. Yeah, well that's exciting. So I don't know whoever wants to take this next question, but um, what's some of the compounds and mushrooms we're talking about here as far as uh, the most uh, exciting things going on with medicinal mushrooms? I'll take that one, Britt. So the, um, the way to kind of think about the valuable compounds within fungi is it's actually kind of best to look at a historical view. So you can look at what's been most popular, as you were saying, kind of over the millennia through traditional use globally, and then start to look at, well, what are the actual active compounds in these most commonly used ones? It's not a coincidence that um, certain species of mushrooms have been uh, associated with health benefits for hundreds or thousands of years. And so you can see, you know, out of especially traditional Chinese medicine, Eastern medicine, and in general, uh, common names like reishi, uh, cordyceps, uh, lion's mane. Uh, if you look at the actual compounds underneath these, they actually may be stand-ins for, for some things like sleep aids, for uh, energy boosters, uh, antivirals, also um, you know, things like anti-anxiety medications. And, and honestly, most interestingly, uh, lion's mane has been shown recently to be neuroprotective to actually you know, help people that may have neurological damage, et cetera. So they're really an exciting group of compounds when you can kind of drill down into the, into the details. Yeah, the heresium I've been seeing quite a bit of, um, and, and it's really exciting. William, what, what, what were you going to say? I was going to say um, uh, along the same lines, In um, I think that it's really interesting with mushrooms now as we're starting to 
um, be inquisitive about more of these compounds, especially now that more people are finding the uh, commercial um, appeal to them. Um, that's where, you know, the research funds usually come in, into, into play. Um, we're starting to discover compounds that are named after the mushrooms that we found them in. So we call these, you know, uh, species specific novel compounds. Um, so with the, with the heresium species, because it goes beyond heresium arenaceus now, most people are like lion's mane, lion's mane, um, which has the uh, arenaceans and heresianones, which goes along with the name heresium arenaceus. Um, because they're, they're found only in, in that species. Um, but we found that the Heresium corolloides also has corallosins, uh, one, two, three, or ABC, whatever you want to call them, um, three different unique compounds in Heresium corolloides that are also neuroprotective uh, uh, and uh, can induce, um, you know, neural health or, or um, neurological regeneration and has some benefits for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, you know, like Ganodermas, we have Ganoderans, uh, pleurotus, we have pleuronans, cordyceps, we have cordycepin. Um, so you see like a lot of these names are uh, associated with the mushroom because they're novel in nature, which is really unique um, and really, really interesting to, to uh, be involved with now. Yeah, that's, that's definitely very exciting. And kind of along those lines, uh, one of the really hot topics, in fact, kind of a, even a, a, a schism right now is the sustainability of harvesting these mushrooms for these compounds versus the other side is, well, a lot of these can be cultivated. So that's way more sustainable than cutting polypores off of a tree or, you know, uh, raking up things to look for cordyceps or what have you. However, uh, some of the, the um, collectors from the wild will argue that, well, they don't always have the same compounds when they're taken from the wild versus the ones that are cultivated. So um, I wonder who all can maybe comment on, on this topic. Yeah, uh, Mason, yeah. I can touch a little bit on this from my own personal local view. Um, yeah, I think there's um, a big opportunity for mushrooms because of their unique potential to be um, pretty adaptable that we can grow them on many different things. and. That is going to, I think, close a lot of loops in sort of the circular economy thinking. And then if we are going to kind of have one foot in that world and, and one foot in sort of the research, clinical, therapeutic world, we're going to have to also follow and um, try to balance both of those. And when you start to look at some of the active compounds, um, they're highly dependent on the substrate and the growth medium that they're grown on. So just trying to figure out, you know, where um, each of the strengths lie, I think, is a big part of that um, conversation in terms of sustainability, regeneration, and also um, clinical value. Um, just looking at all the clinical studies that have been done in Asia and some of the more newer ones in, in the West, um, a lot of them are using extracts and specifically an isolated extract of a mushroom. And then we get down to different tiers where you have an extract at a certain ratio and then also just powder. So those are some things just to um, consider when kind of bridging this um, conversation. Yeah, interesting. So, um, and I, I see your hand up, uh, William. One, one other sort of follow-up and maybe you were even gonna comment on this. So you just mentioned that the in the, in the cultivated species, the compounds inside of them can actually differ simply by what they're being cultivated on, uh, what the substrate is. And I wonder if the extraction process, you know, steam, hot water, alcohol, what have you, I wonder how that changes what comes out of the mushroom as well. Any, any information on that? Um, I'd love to hear what Rob has to say too. Um, it, <laughs> Uh, we're, we're actually engaged in some research together. So there's, there's a lot of aspects of this. Um, but uh, in, in, in my research and um, what we're being shown and, and proven time and time again is that uh, we can actually induce um, hyperproduction of specific compounds by, um, you know, figuring out the uh, bio or the synthetic pathways that the mushrooms are using, what it requires um, and then, you know, providing the mushroom with the, you know, appropriate levels of these things. So uh, we can induce hyperproduction of, of certain compounds 
um, where they will have higher levels of what will be found in nature. Um, but the other, but on the other note is that um, regional natu- regional wild mushrooms um, will um, be exposed to um, pathogens and, and things like that in the natural environment and be producing um, met- metabolic enzymes um, that are unique to their uh, counterparts of the same species in other regional uh, environments. Um, so in that understanding, you know, eating mushrooms from your own area, it could be the, just a basic oyster mushroom. It'll have different metabolic enzymes in it in the wild than it would uh, from some oyster mushrooms that you would find uh, growing in the wild in California versus Pennsylvania, you know? Um, so it may be, um, and then more research needs to be done, but it may be beneficial to be consuming wild mushrooms as well from your own uh, area. Hmm. Um, I'd love to uh, just piggyback on that quickly. Uh, Kind of the flip side of that as well, though, is uh, there can be concerns with wild harvested mushrooms because they're bioaccumulators. So um, to just say that like the wild harvesting, it it is very, you know, it's, it's good and it's bad depending on what environment it grows in. It can be more beneficial because it's based off of what it eats, what, what substrates it's consuming, what kind of nutrients it's getting in that natural environment, but that includes everything. So the good, the bad, kind of everything in between. So there's always that, you know, if you're going to a, um, like an old growth kind of, you know, untouched, less polluted land, you know, you're much more likely to get less of those, uh, potentially toxic or harmful, uh, environmental pollutants, but that is a concern on the wild, uh, side as well. So a bit of a, uh, a plus for the, for the cultivated, but as, as William was saying, you know, uh, technology is becoming so advanced in how we grow these cultivated mushrooms to be able to amplify and like isolate those beneficial compounds without the potential harmful ones that might come in. Um, and as you said, you know, sustainability is, is a huge concern. One of the biggest concerns with the chaga harvesting in the beginning was that everyone was so excited because there was money to be made around it. And it was this fun new hobby that people got to engage in, but, um, when you talk to sustainable chaga harvesters um, in the north of Canada, you know, I've, I've spoken with a few of these groups and and they're very intentional about their harvesting practices and how they map them out on um, like geolocators and they ensure like, you know, we know the life cycle of the mushroom and when we should harvest it so that we're able to make sure that the reproduction is effective, that we know we can come back five years from now and there will be a whole new mushroom and leaving 20% and and all those kinds of things. So definitely methods in the wild harvesting realm for sustainability, but just, uh, yeah, a couple little points from my side. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with Aaron here. I think the sustainability is probably one of the biggest concerns for wild harvesting. And there's a couple of good examples of this. So the traditional source for Cordyceps, Cordyceps sinensis, is effectively going extinct in Tibet, where it's commonly uh, harvested and the the price is then shot through the roof. You can see similar patterns in the pricing for gourmet truffles out of Europe, where the the supply is so limited that the the price is in the thousands of dollars and really only attainable to a small sort of fraction of people. So I think that's really one of the biggest uh, questions. And also William's exactly right too, that if we target the compounds that we need medically, absolutely the cultivation of uh, fungi is very complex and they're very sensitive to the environments that they're growing in but the tools that we have now we can absolutely bring these fungi into the lab and then target specific cultivation specific compounds we just need to know those targets and really you know leverage the process uh, there and it's actually what my lab in Denver is really focused on and so it's something that's exciting to see these tools kind of coming to fruition and solving these problems that you know as the compounds become more popular, which they, they should because of their efficaciousness. You know, we need to think through how to, how to more and more people get access without any of these inherent sort of other problems as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, Aaron brought up a really good point about, um, you know, most people think everything taken from nature is, is natural and therefore safer. And, you know, I would I'd point out that there's lead and arsenic and stuff that is a natural compound, but uh, Aaron mentioned there can be even from naturally harvested mushrooms, toxins that they can pick up. They can bio- bioaccumulate things like this that a lot of people, you know, maybe aren't even thinking about, but that then um, uh, brought about a question that I've long wondered and I don't often see a lot of information is how much do we know about other things in mushrooms, even the cultivated ones, uh, how much do we know about anything that might be 
toxic in them, some other compounds, anything addictive or things that can have a, a negative effect on a person and also who regulates this uh, sort of stuff, if at all. So who can take this next question? Ooh. Um, all right. So <laughs> that's a loaded one there, you know, there's this mushroom that can be cultivated. I don't see it cultivated that much. I've only seen it cultivated a couple of times in Oregon, uh, the Caprinus comatis. I don't know what the compound is in it. Um, it's an easily Google search. You could figure it out. Um, but there's a compound in it that, um, can inhibit your body's ability to process alcohol. Oh, um, right. Yeah. Co coprine. Coprine. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's that. Um, I know that cordycepin, um, one of the reasons that it's so effective is that it can inhibit uh, RNA transcription, um, which at, at the doses that we're consuming it at, you know, I don't see people consuming like ounces of cordyceps at a time. Um, I mean, maybe some people do in Asia and their soups and stuff like that. I don't know. But at, at certain thresholds, it can go and potentially be harmful. I don't know what the threshold is, but at most of the um, consumption rates, it's going to be inhibiting uh, fast replicating cells like, you know, cancer cells, or um, I've even seen uh, um, cordycepin and cordyman, another novel compound in cordyceps, uh, the ability to inhibit uh, HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. So, um, there's some interesting things like that, which I don't fully understand. Um, but as far as like addictive or other um, compounds that are being produced, um, I don't know if anybody has any noticeable effects. I know that things like uh, Verpa, I know that's not cultivated, but it is um, uh, picked in the Pacific Northwest, has some sort of compound in it that people warn you about not consuming a lot of it. Um, but again, I, I don't know enough to speak on that. That's a really, I, I would like to know that now. That'll be a question I'll carry with me. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, it's, a, it's always an interesting question when you have these natural sources of medically interesting, medically potent compounds, and you tend to have categories, and sometimes these can actually play against each other. And so, you know, from a, a drug design or sort of a treatment design point of view, you kind of want to know what the activities of each of the individual constituents are, and then justify them all being part of the, the mixture, if you will. You know, nature provides a a specific mixture, but if you're looking to try to make the effects either more potent, more efficacious, to add safety, it's often by understanding the, the sort of precise nature of the mixture and then maybe removing one component or boosting another that really allows, you know, enhanced safety or, or you know, control of these sorts of properties. So the, the one of those cases where the devil's honestly in the details. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good point. So and I, I think that kind of segues into sort of another big topic uh, which is uh, what do these uh, functional and medicinal compounds in the mushrooms, what exactly do they do in the human body? And I mean, we could probably spend all day talking about it, but just give us some, uh, some quick facts here. Who wants this one? Erin, do you have your, are you pressing your button? <laughs> I can, I can uh, do a set and then I'm sure there will be a lot to add here from the, uh, yeah. from the other panelists. But um, I think, I mean, from everything that I, I learned, part of why I got so excited about functional and medicinal mushrooms in the first place was this expansive library of benefits that, you know, once you start going, you're like, wow, this is, you know, such an untapped resource uh, in so many parts of the world, you know, in, in North America, especially where, as, as William said, we're really only kind of tuning in more uh, to them and to how they work and and we build a relationship with them and, and our day-to-day -day use. But um, just, yeah, understanding the biology of how mushroom mycelium work and how they've existed, like some of the oldest organisms in the world, they've had to fight and adapt to their environment. That's part of why like they're, they're classified as adaptogens or, you know, many of them are classified as adaptogens is, is they've had to build this kind of like symbiotic relationship with every environment that they're in because they exist as a mycelium, as a single celled organism 
under the soil where there's microbes and bacteria and viruses and all kinds of things that they're kind of like fighting for uh, nutrients for having to like work in symbiosis in the case of like mycorrhizae, which work in a relationship with the roots of plants and trees. So just the diversity of how uh, mushrooms interact with their environments is, is one of the things that we learn more and more about how they benefit the human body. Coming into the human body and acting as balancers for hormones or dysregulate, like dysregulated systems, um, which, you know, we're all pretty plagued in our daily life with disruption because of stress, because of pollutants, all these kinds of things. So mushrooms really kind of come in and act as, as these allies in a lot of ways um, when obviously used purposefully and intentionally in the right ways um, to help build up immunity, uh, fight viruses, protect us from bacteria, be anti-tumor as William was talking about, like uh, a lot of the exciting research around potential anti-tumor applications. So. Yeah, it's, it's a hugely untapped world, but I will hand it over to the others to complete. <laughs> Whoever wants to jump in I'm, late. Yeah, I mean, I, that was great. I love, I love everything that Aaron said. Um, it's so, like, I've been, I've been, every single one of my talks, I say the same thing. I say that um, humans are the ultimate scientific tool designed by nature and are more uh, evolved to understand symbolic language over auditory language. And then I quote Terence McKenna saying that DNA is protein syntax uttering itself into existence. And through all of the ecological symbiotic relationships that I've noticed through my research over the past 10 years, time and time again, we're witnessing plants and fungi producing, you know, unique chemicals or attractants for, you know, mammals or other plants. Um, through different times of the years, you know, to uh, maybe draw different mammals to spread their spores, spread their seed, um, and you know, rewarding um, the other part, the other parts of the ecosystem for uh, completing those tasks. You know, uh, we see this with the truffle, um, you know, inducing adult neurogenesis and uh, providing anandamide, the bliss molecule, for uh, any small mammal that would be able to find it, um, consume it, and spread its spore. Um, we see this with uh, uh, um, cordyceps, you know, since I'm the cordyceps guy, everybody says all the time, um, cordyceps, because of their uh, unique dietary habits of uh, consuming insects, but not only consuming insects, uh, hijacking some of their uh, um, functioning systems while they're still alive, um, requires the use of molecular tools because um, they're, they're doing work within the cells of these organisms. So they have to have means of, you know, um, you know jacking into the, the nervous system of, or, or the equivalent of a nervous system of these insects. Um, and because of that, um, the, the compounds that, you know, could terrorize an insect, you know, prove to be quite uh, unique and uh, enjoyable uh, to a more highly evolved mammalian system. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, understanding the unique um, biochemistry at play through seasonal changes in the environment, um, the mushrooms that come up, the relationships that they have with, um, you know, the insect life, the, the, the birds, the, 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 bee, the birds, the bees, you know, the mammals, um, which ones they draw. Um, and then we can, we can learn so much, you know, certain insects are, are drawn to certain chemical compounds. Why is that mushrooms producing certain chemical compounds? You know, it's, there's like, there's so much to learn when we just start to look at it and it'll all just, you know, it'll, you get these like aha moments all the time. Once you start to like do these kinds of, do this kind of research. Cause you're like, Oh, this is why this bird is coming here. This is why this animal is in this environment. Or like, this is why this mushroom is yellow. You know, like it's the, the unique colors, even that mushrooms produce. Like, have you ever gone out into the woods wearing a color that's not in the woods? And then like some random bug just starts flying around your shirt or something, <laughs> you know? Because that there's so much at play here, you know, even down to the pigments that's like uh, for cordyceps, cordyxanthins, the unique compounds, the unique uh, uh, pigment, carotenoid pigment that is named after the cordyceps because it's unique to the cordyceps that produces that really orange uh, uh, color has medicinal compounds. So you know, there's it's so complex. I could just ramble, ramble on about it forever with no end. The complexity really is amazing, and I think to me the 
the thing that I always come back to, and we've mentioned it a couple of times here, is this ability for neuro uh, regeneration, you know, regeneration or regrowth of neurons. And partly it's because when I was a graduate student doing my PhD work um, and I was taking developmental biology courses, this was always something that was taught that this does not happen. You know, you have adult neurons that differentiate and they become mature and they just sort of stop there. They don't have this potential to regrow. And so the fact that, uh, you know, psilocybin and the related tryptamines for mushrooms, as well as the arenosines, the compounds out of uh, lion's mane are really showing this ability to either protect neurons as they sit mature or allow them to regrow to me is incredibly exciting. And I think this is really why we're seeing this sort of uh, hand in hand uh, medical uses of psilocybin and related compounds with therapy. You know, it's this uh, potential of regrowing neural networks and then combining that with more healthful, you know, uh, thought patterns, lifestyle, et cetera, really has a remodeling of the, um, the nervous system effect. And so to me, that's really the exciting thing because it, you know, it was, it was taught to me for so long that this is just, you know, just not possible and it has such potential for healing. So. So um, uh, one, one sort of follow-up actually to pretty much everyone's comment, there's a word I see a lot of times and you, you, probably already described it maybe without using this word, but I see the word immunomodulator a lot of times and people ask me, what exactly is that? And I'm like, well, I think it's sort of self-explanatory, but I suspect there's probably a lot more to it than that. So I think this kind of goes along with what we're talking about right now. So who can kind of sum up what an immunomodulator is? I can start and then someone I believe will finish. Um, yeah. So Immunomodulation at its basic, most um, simple definition is the ability for the immune system to either um, raise its potential a bit or balance it. So kind of this dual direction capacity that mushrooms seem to have in the system. And to kind of start the process, what they do is they kind of inform your immune system, which we know a lot of it is in our gut. So they kind of inform our system right at the get go from more of an actual um, inflammatory response in the sense that they kind of trigger a lot of these DNA, genetic, cytokine processes that um, really allow different, um, in general, immune cells to be secreted, stimulated in the body for um, their action to take place. So that could be as simple as helping some of our first line defense immune cells in our innate immune system. It could be as simple as activating a macrophage, which is like one of the most basic immune cells that will help um, resist bacteria, virus, parasite, anything kind of in that front line. Um, and a lot of the times it has that unique intelligence where it kind of knows what it wants to do in the body, whether it's this person's just experienced, you know, a harsh chemotherapeutic treatment, or they've just been run down for the last year, that mushroom and that person nine times out of 10 is probably going to boost their immune system a bit, bring the uh, immune system online a bit more. There's other examples where people might be suffering from things like say autoimmunity, and there might be sort of a heightened immune response that not, that is not always healthy. So things like cordyceps might actually be something that can kind of dampen that immune response for that person. Um, when the immune system is kind of um, too high, it'll kind of modulate it and bring it back down. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Eric. Oh, I was just saying beautifully explained. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else yeah. want to add more to that? Um, I'll just I'll just say that for anybody that's interested in further studying immunomodulatory effects um, and why almost all mushrooms share uh, immunomodulatory effects. Um, you're going to want to look into polysaccharides, um, which are long chain sugar, poly, you know, meaning multiple and then saccharide for, sh for sugar. Um, and the polysaccharides are what induce the uh, immunomodulatory response, um, particularly by being non-digestible. Um, they can get through uh, and into places in our body that, you know, a lot of things don't uh, pass through in our digestive system. So, um, you know, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, look into the polysaccharides, you know, unique ones uh, would be uh, PSK polysaccharide crestin from turkey tail, uh, and then the defraction beta glucan uh, from uh, maitake. 
Interesting. So uh, and, uh, now most of the mushrooms we've been talking about up to now are biotrophs like cordyceps lives inside of a living organism as a, as a parasite. Um, there was a talk, Aaron mentioned mycorrhizals. Those are biotrophs. They live on the roots of trees and pretty much farm the trees. And now you've just mentioned William uh, Trimedes and, um, and you know, polypore mushrooms like this, of course, are some of the biggies too that have long been used in Asia. I wonder, um, you know, earlier you mentioned having an aha moment and it just literally a couple of days ago, I was writing up a paper, not having anything to do with medicinal mushrooms, but having to do with what I study, which are arthropods, in particular flies that live inside of mushrooms. And I had an aha moment, which after, I don't know, 35 years of studying these things, it never dawned on me, but I was looking at, at data in this massive table. I could see partitioning of different species based on whether their host mushroom was a biotroph or a saprotroph, you know, whether it was a, a mycorrhizal or some sort of mushroom like that versus something that just rots stuff. And I thought, wonder why I never thought about this. This is very well known in herbivorous, all herbivorous organisms, you know, but for arthropods living in mushrooms, uh, it was unknown. And I didn't make this discovery. I was looking at someone else's data, but I'm wondering, since you now just now mentioned Tremedes, what do we see as far as differences, and if it's known, of compounds, efficacy, what these things do in the body, of mushrooms that are biotrophic versus merely saprotroph? So like Caprinus, the inky cap, that's a, you know, that rot stuff, agaricus rot stuff, Tremedes rot stuff, and cordyceps doesn't, uh, Ericeum. It uh, lives on, on wood as well. So what do we know, biotroph versus, versus saprotroph? And, or, or do we know anything? Who, who has any answers for that? I certainly don't. <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily bin them in the same categories, but I think there's definitely a correlation between the substrate that the fungi are uh, decomposing, metabolizing, et cetera. The higher level of complexity of the chemistry in the substrate, the high, higher potential level of complexity and then possible you know, usefulness in this context uh, in, in the fungi themselves. And so I think that's a, a big theme that I've seen myself. And then you get a sort of a unique property of fungi as well, that they can um, transfer um, gene clusters horizontally. So you get these kind of uh, clusters of species that, you know, grow in the same environment and often make similar compounds because they're, they're uh, swapping back and forth some of the same genetic machinery for doing so. So those are the kind of the, the trends that I see similar to what you're highlighting there, but definitely a correlation between the, you know, hardwoods, for instance, are an excellent producer of complex chemistry. And so a lot of complex chemistries and fungi that decompose hardwoods. I definitely see that trend. Absolutely. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to jump on that one. Uh, so I've been saying for years, because when we first started growing cordyceps, we saw that they could be cultivated on just white rice. And we're like, we didn't have the analytical equipment to be doing any studies at that point. But I'm like, all of these, all of these, uh, compounds are nitrogen nitrogenous based like they're nitrogen based compounds that are like the you know bioactive compounds we want from cordyceps and i'm like where are they going to get all this nitrogen from like this this basic white rice that doesn't really have any protein in it that can break down to make this nitrogen so you would expect and what we're finding now with analytics uh that cordyceps when they're feed when they're fed or more or most mushrooms when they're fed a more complex diet will have more um, Legos, let's say, uh, to choose from to build their spaceship, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is referencing their molecular compounds. You know, you can give it something basic and it can, you know, maybe produce a fruit body to get a spore out, um, but you can give it some complex food source and it can, you know, make all the compounds that it has in its, in its uh, repertoire. Um, and one of the things that also that we've seen um, with, uh, what is it? It's not, it's not Piptoporus anymore. It's uh, Foamy's Betulina. Um, the, the birch polypore, um, birch polypore grown in the wild environment on the, on its natural birch, uh, host can, uh, accumulate betulin, um, out of the tree, um, which is a beneficial anti-cancer compound that's found in the birch wood. Mm -hmm. Um, and, so, in chaga. and same with chaga. 
Yeah, so yeah, they're so some mushrooms when they're growing on their host tree are actually accumulating um, compounds from the tree, um, and as and as much as they uh, can accumulate, you know, unsavory compounds in you know urban environments. That's why I don't eat mushrooms from New York City. Um, they, <laughs> they can trees, especially in the, in in uh, areas like all, all of the East Coast, that's been deforested so many times, and uh, monocrop agriculture has washed away most of the mineral concentration in the uh, top soil uh, levels, trees are accumulating levels of minerals that are found deeper in the soil that most uh, plants on the top level don't have access to, which then the mushrooms are hyper accumulating those minerals um, and mm. become almost like mineral supplements. I um, mean, we've seen this uh, time and time again in the research. Um, so, you know, I, I, would, uh, I would suggest, you know, higher complexities. You know, I, I would suggest, um, you know, complex food sources um, and experimental experimentation with mimicking, um, you know, natural environments um, in ways that are sustainable. You know, I don't want people who are now cut a bunch of birch trees just to, yeah. you know, but um, but that's why that's why humans are so brilliant, because we have the capacity and the research accessible at our fingertips now to be able to design the synthetic uh, uh, sustainable uh, equivalent of, of of the natural environment, you know, the baby food for the mushrooms. <laughs> well, sometimes humans are brilliant, sometimes not so much. But, um, you know, all of this uh, talk in molecular stuff, talk in DNA stuff, this all uh, kind of brings us to what's the, the latest research and, and where is stuff going? So in the time remaining, um, who can tell us on what the latest research is, hot areas and where, you think research is going to be going like over the next, you know, short term, next three to five years? Um, I've been really just dedicated and committed to, like uh, William was talking about, the polysaccharides. Um, I think they're they're old, but I don't think they're going away. I think that um, any kind of oncological cancer-based research usually comes back down to one of the beta glucans, which is a form of the polysaccharide. So I think that new discoveries around different beta glucans, different polysaccharides are going to be more and more popular. Um, and also a new compound, new but old, um, ergothionine. It's an interesting compound that's been found in a lot of the gill mushrooms like shiitake, yellow oyster. So I think there's a lot of interesting preclinical data in the ergothionine world around um, neurodegenerative disease, um, cardiovascular disease, and anything seemingly related to any kind of oxidative stress or anything related with the blood in the body. So those are kind of some areas I'm watching. And I think that um, it's going to be exciting because this is just going to take off once um, we get more research and more field work, which I think is also really important around mycology. Super. Yeah. Aaron. Um, yeah, definitely agreed with what Mason said. I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how the expansion outside of kind of the like main names of mushrooms is going to take place. Uh, you know, you've kind of got your top five or six, like your Rishi, Turkey Tail, Chaga, Lion's Mane, my talk, like these ones that you hear and you see in these like mixed supplements. And, and it's phenomenal that those are becoming more and more accessible and, and understood and how they interact in the body. But, um, with the thousands and millions of like fungal species in the world. I think there's just, there's such an untapped amount of surprises <laughs> that we're about to uncover. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting for me to learn, and I'm, I'm curious to see how that unfolds is how uh, we're learning more and more that like the fungal relationship with plants, how sometimes that actually is what makes a plant or a herb as beneficial as it is. Like there's, you can find traces of parts of the fungi mycelium, these kinds of things, uh, and evidence of that relationship in some of the herbs of Chinese medicine, of, of different Ayurvedic herbs, things like that. So understanding how deep that relationship goes in those complementary medicines uh, is, is a really fascinating subject for myself. And then uh, the, the combining, the combining of these uh, botanicals and things like that, like the more we understand these interactions and relations, 
between uh, natural systems and these derivatives, extracts, things like that, we're able to combine them. Like, like William said, you know, one of the most genius things about humans is that we have this consciousness ability to be able to experiment and to amplify and to find these really incredibly innovative solutions. So um, like for ourselves at Guella, you know, we, we like to kind of find this mix of, of how we can bring those things together and, and say like mushrooms do this, this other herb does this, uh, this botanical extract does that, you know, how can we bring those together and, and hopefully make things that are sustainable because now you're like amplifying the effects of each thing in a complementary relationship. So because mushrooms already exist in that, uh, that kind of reciprocal beneficial relationship already, it's such a natural fit for them to be combined with these, these other natural compounds to, to amplify their effects. And hopefully that'll make the efficacy even more so and, and aid in that sustainability challenges and things like that. So, um, yeah, those are a couple of things that I'm excited for. Oh, that's a great point. I'm, I'm really all about symbioses and, um, that this, it was mentioned at the outset, I have a book coming out in the spring and that's pretty much the crux of it is, uh, fungal symbioses with organisms and, you know, not all symbioses are beneficial. Sometimes they're uh, parasitic or whatever, but there's uh, still an intimate association, but, um, you mentioned a good point. I mean, there's lots and lots of compounds that we know that, that we get from plants, but it turns out they actually get it from the fungus or the key building blocks came from the fungus. So this is really, I, I think this is going to be something that really takes off in the future. And, uh, when, when scientists want to tweak chemicals, I think they're going to really get at some of these, uh, networks that are going on between the two organisms. So, um, if, if no one else has anything more to add to that, I do see a lot of really interesting questions coming in. And are you ready? Or William, you got something else to add? If we're gonna are go you... to questions, that's cool, but... Um... What do you got? You're gonna blow our mind with something else? My head's hurting right now because you've rocked my world with all your info. Ah! You always uh, do. Well, I mean, I, the, the Robert's doing cool stuff. Madison's doing cool yeah. stuff. Uh, with the, with it up in Canada. And I mean, besides that, like, I, th I think that, I don't think that I know that we're entering into the molecular industrial revolution and that a lot of children that are being uh, uh, brought into these kinds of sciences, especially, especially how accessible it's all becoming. Like there's these biotech companies that are making this technology so user friendly. It's like the apple of molecular bio. Now you could just like plug and play. Um, so I think that as we enter into this level of understanding of how the cell operates and how the uh, proteins and um, uh, all of the compounds um, that we love so much from these compounds are even synthesized through, through the mushrooms um, that will really dial into some unique um, um, styles of agriculture that humans have never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're going to be farming fungi in ways that looks radically different than what we do right now. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be alive. Like what, like, who do I have to thank for being born in 1994? Like that was pretty tight, like pretty clutch. <laughs> hey, so new, new, new ways of farming. Does anyone have, this is a question that was asked by um, someone dialing in new ways of farming and growing this stuff and, and, and preparations. Is there anything being done with artificial intelligence right now to cultivate or to isolate stuff? Yeah. What actually, do you think? Um, I, I'll, I'll be happy to, to jump in on that one, Brett. So I, I'm actually sponsoring some artificial intelligence research right now up at the University of Alberta, although it's not necessarily geared at cultivation, much more geared at understanding the uh, medical uh, uh, details of these compounds. So understanding them singularly and in combinations as they're found either out in nature or, at, or when we've isolated them and then recombine them into uh, to different combinations. So absolutely. Uh, my just <laughs> Is there, any, is there anything in the literature that someone might be able to hold in their hands and read about this? 
So really the literature there is more from the um, pharmacy and you know drug discovery side of things, but these are applications that have already been looked at for other areas of drug uh, discovery. And we're sort of taking that technology and then applying it into the um, mycology space. But really what you can think of is you're basically making a computer model of the individual cellular receptors that these molecules are docking to and then screening them, you know, one to the next to the next to look at the diversity. It's a great tool for looking at the diversity that we've been talking about today. That sounds really cool. Anyone else have anything to add on that? So here's another question that came in that um, I've wondered about myself because um, it's pretty well known and highly touted these days about heresium and uh, nerve cell regrowth and, and neuroplasticity and all this sort of stuff. And, and it was even touched on more than once during this conversation. Any other mushrooms or mushroom compounds or groups of mushrooms th that are known to have the same effect? Because I, I can't think of any. So there's actually just cutting edge research coming out in the last two weeks, actually. I think it's just at two weeks uh, old at the moment. But what it is, is out of Yale Medical School, they've shown that in mice, uh, given psilocybin once, that you actually can demonstrate uh, additional neuron growth for out past a month. And so this, at least in an animal model, is highly suggestive that you know, it's the same effect that you're talking about. But it remains to be seen in humans. But this is kind of where all the data is pointing to. You know, now that you mentioned, I did see something about psilocybin having that effect too. And of course, it's always been sort of uh, stated that it's uh, psilocybin seems to sort of rewire your a person's brain. And it literally could be doing that if it has a, a neurogenitive. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. New neurons plus stimuli equals new neuron patterns. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, what, what do you got, William? Um, well, I mentioned it earlier. Um, and, you know, I, hear myself talk all the time. So I'm really excited to see what Mason has to say, but I'll just yep. go through it really quickly. Um, that there is research um, and it's, and I actually was first made aware of it at the Telluride Mushroom Festival in 2017 or 2018, whenever we had Michelle Ross um, and she did her talk, she mentioned that uh, truffles can induce adult neurogenesis. And I delved into the research afterwards when I got back home um, and found out that it's that it is true and there's research showing that uh, truffles produce anandamide truffles have an endocannabinoid system and truffles that do can induce adult neurogenesis and you know it's part of the reason it's probably part of the reason why they're so appealing um and i think and i think that uh, because of the price as mentioned before not that many humans have had the ability to consume enough to experience those effects um and if anybody is interested i'll be publishing posting more about it but i've been working on this truffled bowl theory uh, about how uh, the mammals that survived the extinction of the dinosaurs that were had a very intimate relationship with their underground hole dwellings and consuming fungi that were subterranean um, had uh, unique evolutionary experiences in relation to the truffles. So if anybody wants to fall down that rabbit hole, I have some stuff on my Instagram. I'll have more on that soon, but truffles for sure. I'll definitely be... Um following along there, William. That sounds um, <laughs> like something I need to read about. Um, I'll just drop another couple ideas in people's minds about things to consider um, independent of lion's mane. Um, another medicinal mushroom that has uh, a clinical study done on um, brain and subjective cognitive um, impairment is tremella. Um, there's an interesting study showing that it can actually increase the gray matter in certain parts of the brain and um, reduce some of the symptoms that comes with dementia and other neurovascular diseases. So that's the one thing independent of lion's mane that I've seen in that arena. Um, another one which I've already mentioned is ergothionine. It's a, a fantastic new compound that we're learning more and more about. And there are some really good preclinical studies showing that um, populations like Europeans versus North Americans that eat more medicinal mushrooms have a lower rate of neurodegenerative um, disease and complications from those neurodegenerative diseases. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, and one other thing is the endocannabinoid system. And before you say, hey, hey, there's no way these things interact with CB1, CB2 receptors. Um, <laughs> but indirectly, there's ways that um, thought leaders and scientists are kind of um, determining how medicinal mushrooms might actually play a role in the innate and um, the adaptive immunity and this whole new branch of medicine known as the acquired um, innate immunity. So 
Um, that's an area where I think really comes into mind when I think of anything brain, because you have that um, element of that um, very multifactorial thing um, when looking at it from that very micro perspective of a neuron and then also looking at general brain health. Oh, that's fascinating. So you mentioned a tremella, which no one has mentioned yet today, and it's kind of a genus that doesn't often get a lot of limelight. A tremella is kind of a jellyish looking mushroom that looks a lot like auricularia, which is another important medicinal mushroom. And in fact, um, it's well known you can overdo it on eating that because it has such a powerful blood thinning component. But where I'm going with this is uh, being a field mycologist, uh, I should caution everyone listening that be super careful what you're picking from the wild, just as you should be super careful what you buy from a store or a seller because there are charlatans out there, but you should be really careful of what you pick from the wild because a lot of mushrooms look like other mushrooms and this gets people into trouble all the time. Sometimes it just may have no effect, but sometimes it can make you quite ill. So as an example in uh, the special edition on chaga, which is you know such a huge uh, popular important mushroom, we had a special edition on chaga in Fungi Magazine several years back, and we had a whole section on things that look like chaga that people mistake for them. And all of these literally came from websites, I mean, actual websites of products, Facebook pages and what have you, of what people erroneously were selling as chaga. And you could see what the fruit body was or the hunk of whatever it was that they were showing. And it was clearly not chaga, but you know, if you're not a mycologist, I mean, it's it's kind of tough to know. So the only way to, to be sure what you're collecting for food or medicine is to absolutely know your mushroom and not, uh, not poison yourself or get into some sort of problems. I mean, uh, death from mushroom poisoning absolutely happens every year in North America and in Europe. So it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, and this happens with uh, people looking for psilocybin mushrooms too. They're very, very difficult to recognize from other small brown mushrooms. Almost none of them occur on dung. Most of them occur on, you know, rotting debris. But there's a lot of deadly poisonous small brown mushrooms that look just like psilocybin mushrooms. So for those out there tuning in, don't become a statistic and uh, make sure you know what you're doing. So um, let's see, looking at the time, we are now at 2.01. And I think, is that about uh, the end of our show? We have to wait for our overlords to tell us. I think this is about the end of the show. So um, any um, any final words anyone has? I've, I've said my final words on uh, being careful what you pick. Anyone else have words of wisdom to offer? Uh, maybe if, uh, for the presenters, maybe let the audience know where People can follow you, find out more of what you're doing. That might be a good way to kind of wrap up um, your end. Absolutely. So I think it's a really exciting time as far as, you know, like we've been talking about all the tools that are coming out, our understanding of the underlying chemistry, how that can be used for human health. I think it's an incredibly exciting time. And to, you know, follow what we're doing at Midas and you can go to Midasin.com and follow us that way. We're really active on uh, social media and uh, you know, are often, you know, uh, presenting out in the community, et cetera. So, you know, happy to, to have people follow us that way. Robert, I'll see you at the Telluride Mushroom Festival, I guess, probably. I know yeah, my distance going to have a bunch of people there. And I'll right. see William there as well. Very excited about it. So, <laughs> Aaron, any final thoughts from you? Yeah. Um, yeah, this has been really great. Super informative. Um, that's the great thing about being a mushroom nerd is there's always <laughs> so much more to learn. Um, so I guess that's that would be my, my wisdoms to share is that, you know, really, Mushrooms are incredible beings that as soon as you fall into their midst, um, it's pretty hard not to fall in love with them and all the ways that they can help and we can build relationships with them and, and really do a lot of good in this world. So yeah, encourage everyone to become a myco nerd. <laughs> I'm biased. Yeah, definitely. Mason, uh, what about you? Yeah, if you're interested in more of the sort of wellness, clinical use of mushrooms, you can um, find me at www.realmushrooms.com. And our Instagram and Facebook is just real underscore mushrooms. And yeah, I think like Aaron said, I think mycology and this whole conversation is so 
multifactorial. So I think getting a good diverse um, following is really good. And this is a, a sort of micro look at that community. So just following the other participants to get a whole well-rounded um, approach on mycology and medicinal mushrooms for ther therapy and medicinal use. William? Cool. Um, if you haven't already uh, quit your job and devote your life to mushrooms, that's a tribute to the late and great Gary. Uh, and um, yeah, you can find me at uh, mycosymbiote on Instagram, mycosymbiotics, um, mycofest, um, and uh, apex grower on YouTube. And uh, yep, propagate myceliate. Let's grow together. Bing. <laughs> That's awesome. And um, you can uh, see utterances from me on the Fungi Magazine Facebook page, the Telluride Mushroom Festival Facebook page, because I'm the executive director, or you can check out Fungi Magazine at fungimag.com. And we publish five times a year on all things fungal. And that's what I'm all about. I'm a micro nerd as Aaron said. So thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you in the forest.